All right, um, here we are. Uh, welcome to, to everybody to this um, webinar, uh, which is our first virtual autoware meetup that we're trying in this new format. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, it's uh, six o'clock in, in the West Coast uh, here in the US, um, really late night in Europe and very early morning uh, in, in Asia Pacific. So welcome wherever you're joining from. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our panelists whom I'll be introducing shortly. So to get things started, uh, a few housekeeping items um, uh, that I will just present uh, to introduce myself. My name is Sanjay Krishnan, VP of product at Apex AI. And Apex AI is hosting this on behalf of uh, uh, the AutoWare Foundation. And <clears throat> we, um, just a few ho housekeeping items that I'm mentioning, please ask questions um, anytime you want, but please use the Q&A button um, uh, in, in this uh, webinar that should be available to you. Um, that Q&A button lines up questions uh, for me to look at, and uh, I will try to either alert the panelists um, or, or the panelists will, will pick it up and answer um, as time permits. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, for, for future viewing, so hopefully we will be able to post it soon, um, as soon as it becomes available. Um, all right, so with that mentioned, um, I also want to say a couple of things. First, uh, about Apex AI itself. Uh, we make uh, production-grade software for autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're also a founding member of the AutoWare Foundation, and uh, you can find more about us at uh, apex.ai. <clears throat> um, I should also point out uh, that one of the things that you will see um, new in, from the AutoWare uh, point of view um, is a course in 14 parts about how to design uh, self-driving cars with Rost and AutoWare. Also hosted by Apex AI, you can find that on the Apex AI website and go register for it if you haven't seen it already. Something that I mentioned, wanted to mention because this is something that's topical of interest and we're seeing a lot of interest in it. Um, obviously it's all free, it's open source um, and it's got a lot of good material in there. And finally, uh, to today's panelists, uh, thank you very much and welcome uh, to Dr. Pecker and Dr. Parr. Dr. Ali Pecker is the founder and CEO of uh, Adastec, and Dr. Parr is the CTO. Um, Adastec has been involved in uh, autonomous systems and uh, they will tell you all about um, their approach to autonomous public transportation, uh, the technology behind it, um, about a little bit about their company, and uh, we will divide it into sections and we will also <clears throat> um, use Q&A breaks in, the main, in, uh, in between, um, depending on how the questions uh, come up. To get things started, I want to launch, start off with a poll since this is a virtual meetup. You should be able to see our first poll here. Um, so please go ahead if you see the poll Go ahead and answer it. I'll give it a few seconds uh, and I will share the results of that poll. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now with 75% uh, almost 80 percent responding thank you for your responses it was a simple questions a uh, simple question pretty much to uh warm up uh our our, our poll taking you know, as part of this webinar um and uh, it's it's a tie between um between use public transport <clears throat> more often and no change in my use of public transport if public transportation was autonomous so it's interesting uh, for you guys to see. So with that, let's uh, launch right into our panelists. So um, Dr. Pecker, uh, please go ahead and, uh, and kick it off. Okay, I think you need to stop sharing so I can share my screen. Absolutely. Yeah.
Okay. Um, hi, everybody, again. Uh, I'll start by shortly introducing what we are doing in ADAS Tech. So we provide a automated level for bus, which will be working on a controlled area. So it will be a predefined route, which is normal for public transportation. Generally, you know the route of the bus. And uh, it also can work in dedicated roads, limited access roads also to, uh, we are also targeting mixed traffic conditions. Uh, it's level four automated. It's since the bus service is very close to the definition of level four, since we know the route of the bus. So it's, uh, we know the uh, map of the area so that we have specific geofenced, uh, weather fenced uh, operation. So our operation is very well integrated with cloud services. Uh, normally, most of the uh, automated cars, robot taxis, automated vehicles are connected vehicles, but this type of connection is more important when you are thinking about shared operation, fleet operation, you, uh, you send some of the perception data to the cloud, you share some of the perception with other services. Also, you connect with maybe with road equipment, other vehicles, so you can get uh, very important information through the cloud. So, of course, it's a shared fleet operation. So we as expect in the future virtual bus stops. So instead of having physical bus stops, you can have virtual locations collected by the demand coming from mobile phones and you can uh, create dynamic bus stops. So uh, you can have better shared fleet operations with the system. Uh, so what we are doing at the moment as we have a OEM agreement in place, it's a European producer called Carsan. They're producing their buses in Turkey. Uh, it's a BMW powered bus. So electrification is done by BMW, uh, which is good since BMW already have a lot of experience in electric cars with the I series. So uh, uh, we started working together with Carsan uh, for automating their eight meter uh, electric bus powered by BMW called Attack. So I will give you some more details in, uh, later on about the bus. So another thing is that we will have some deployments with this bus. Uh, here's the two examples, one of them in Europe, one of them in US. The first one will be in Romania, uh, quickly followed by the deployment in Michigan State University. It's a, a pilot project funded by Planet M at the moment. And also we will, it will be open to some partners who will like to test their technology or integrate their technology to uh, public transportation. So we will having real life deployment. We will be carrying students or people in a technical zone and we will make in automated routes. So we are planning around 10 to 20, uh, uh, completion per day and we will be sharing the data uh, uh, of these pilots we will have a open uh, data data like other uh, automated driving companies are doing uh, the good thing is since we are using AutoWare, it will be uh, easier to use with AutoWare. also we will have extra modalities and mapping so uh, stay tuned, we will be providing uh, interesting data coming out from the, these pilots. So uh, if you look at to the domain of public transportation and automation, uh, we have some global expectations uh, in the automotive that the revenues will continue to increase but most of the profits will be coming from shared mobility, digital services, software services. So the companies like us, everybody is targeting this mostly to the uh, more profitable, profitable area of uh, digital services, technological services. So 
this is huge since uh, I've been working in software area a lot. Uh, there are, uh, you know, a lot of companies targeting technological ser uh, services, but this uh, expected revenue increase and profit increase is also uh, very huge compared to other software, uh, s uh, classical software, uh, IT software. So uh, if we have a look, the, uh, the autonomy as a consumer product or a service, we are in this autonomy as a service area. The problem is a little bit easier. So if you are targeting a car, which can run autonomously anywhere all the time. So the, uh, it's a much difficult problem for think about it. For example, if you are thinking about using HD maps, so you should be covering everywhere in the world. But if you are doing a geofenced operation like us, so you can easily cover uh, the area with HD maps. Uh, also, if you are doing an, a consumer product, it should run in every weather condition. But to keep the uh, sensor cost down, you can target maybe uh, less severe weather conditions in the autonomy as a service. Also, the other than the safety economy is already there in the fleet operations, since you are optimizing the labor, not only the driving time of a single driver. So we expect that it will scale uh, linearly with the user base and it's much more easier to service. So that's why uh, the fleet operations, commercial fleets is expected to be automated much more faster than personally owned vehicles. And as Adastec, uh, we are targeting this curve to deploy our services much more earlier. So this concludes the uh, first part, I think. And uh, with this uh, slide, the, uh, one of the things we are focusing the public transportation is that, you know, normally uh, with the personally owned cars, uh, as far as I know, in the United States, there is 1.1 or 1.2 people per car. So automating them, converting them to shared cars or electric cars uh, will not make easier uh, for the traffic jams. So uh, in the, uh, it won't decrease the traffic jams. The only the possible way to decrease the traffic jam is uh, public transportation. So uh, in the new era of transportation, we believe that if we can make uh, automated uh, buses, uh, there will be more buses on the road. So it will be an easier access. So we believe that by introducing automated buses, we can also cope with traffic jam problem, which is maybe the one of the most important problems of transportation together with safety. Perfect. Um, I don't see any Q and A in uh, um, coming up yet, but this may be a, a time to have a couple of more quick polls. So, if the folks in the audience would uh, would would indulge me, um, I'm going to run you through another couple of quick questions. First one being, what's your role? Um, check off if you're in engineering, business, or a different type of role. Uh, this will also give us some insight into what are the topics that you might be more interested in. And I understand uh, from the comments that if you are using uh, Zoom uh, through a browser, you may not be able to um, see the polls. I'm not totally sure about that, um, but it's something that I've noted. Okay, uh, closing the poll. So um, clearly more than half the uh, um, audience here today are actually working uh, on the software side of autonomous vehicles. Okay, good to know. Just uh, hold on there for one more quick question. Uh, this one is about your organization and uh, we're, we want to ask you about what your organization does and, uh, and if you would uh, answer based on 
your company or your organization, whether it's, it's um, technology, non-technology, or in fact, not related to, to uh, autonomous mobility in any way. Very cool, thank you for uh, answering that. Obviously, not surprisingly, again, we have an overwhelming number of folks here from directly working in, uh, in the tech for autonomous mobility. Excellent, before we go into the sec next section, um, I'm gonna ask you one more question, um, and this one a little more uh, about what types of sensors you use, because we're gonna be transitioning to that topic quickly. Now understand, uh, please take a look at your, your survey and let us know if, you're, if your autonomous systems that you're working on, e even if you're a software uh, person, uses radars, lighters, cameras, and, and keep in mind that this is a multiple choice question. So, so select all that apply. Also, there's a question coming in, I think, in Q&A section. Um, that's right. Um, do you want to go ahead and uh, answer that question, uh, Dr. Dr. Becker, while we share the... I'm almost the question about... is... Yep, yeah. go ahead. The que question is, will autonomy result in small number of large buses or large number of small buses? So what I expect, it large number of large buses and large number of small buses. So it'll be a complete service. So maybe the main routes will be handled by large buses. We will see later on so effects of COVID. So possibly people don't want too many people in a bus. So small buses will not be a choice. Like mid-sized buses that like we do uh, can be used. And also you can also make a virtual articulation of the buses. So you can have like, instead of having one 24 meter bus, you can have three eight meter bus and make it flexible. And for the last mile and the first mile, you can have those small shuttle buses to carry people to their home. So you can have a fully autonomous journey from door to door. So I expect that, uh, I expect that if we can manage to provide a better service uh, with the public transportation, uh, there will be more number of buses also but you will have less labor and less energy with the automation and electrification. I think another question, uh, so what happens when the bed, weather is bad? Do you need a driver to take over for the day? Yeah, that's possible. Depending on the uh, weather, normally we are targeting light rain, uh, light snow, but if there's heavy snow, very, very bad conditions, you can still have the driver for that day instead of spending uh, too much money to the sensors. This can change with technology, but this is the basic idea. So you can, for example, in our case, the, uh, our bus is still a drivable bus. You, we still have the steering wheel since we expect that the bus will be uh, driven to the route by a human driver. Same thing can, be, can happen in uh, very, very bad conditions. Perfect. And, um, and, and the, the question about the weather might tell us a little bit why we are seeing a lot of camera as, as the survey came back with in terms of the sensors that are used in, in uh, the systems that people are working with. So that's, let's pause the polls for now and uh, get back uh, Dr. Becker to the next section. So uh, if you look at the, uh, um, the important pillars that we are deploying, uh, normally there are two approaches to automation like everybody knows. You can have an end-to-end uh, automation software, which, which is that you collect all the sensor data, there's an AI somehow and decides on uh, decides on what uh, the, your uh, control. So, but most of the people like uh, AutoWare 
uh, using modular approach. So you have different AIs maybe in the modules like localization, perception, prediction, and path planning. And then uh, you expect that those modules can work together. And then, uh, so you localize your vehicle, you try to understand what's around you, and then you try to understand what they're gonna do, and you decide on your path and you apply to the control. So this is the basic idea in the modular approach, which we follow, and we use AutoWare uh, for this modular approach, and also to be able to agile in the production of our software, since with AutoWare, you always have something to demo. So otherwise, if you start from scratch, you try to implement everything by yourself. So it means that if you are trying to make a better localization, it will be the only thing you have. You will not be able to demonstrate a full system. But with AutoWare, you can have a, something running at the very beginning also. And then you can, if you want to change some of these parts, you can easily use the existing modules or you can modify or replace them thanks to open software. So other than the software stack, of course, you have a, some type of a operating system. So AutoWare uh, uses ROS and we expect that this uh, underlying software will be also ready to use in a production environment. So we expect that it will be coming from partners like Apex AI so that we can, if we just uh, auto uh, make our software to be able to, uh, which can be used in a automotive environment, we hope that the uh, underlying software will be, uh, uh, autom uh, will be uh, deployment great. Also uh, in the simulation and HTML, currently we are creating our own maps but uh, we expect that there will be companies providing that. We are working so, uh, with some of them already. There are companies that we know in the past. And uh, for simulation, there are very nice uh, open source software. We are using LG SVL at the moment. So we are generating the simulation content. Also, we are doing something extra in the content generation. It can be some, uh, it can be another company in the future, but at the moment we are producing our simulation content by ourselves. So in the sensor kit part, there are a lot of companies supplying that. In LiDAR, we are using Auster LiDAR. And also we are getting a lot of help from uh, companies like Autonomous Stuff, since they uh, provide a package of sensor kit to you. And uh, you can focus on rather on your software with, these, uh, uh, with the help of these companies. And uh, also drive-by conversion is a problem in commercial vehicles since generally the commercial vehicles are, are come a little bit behind uh, compared to uh, uh, passenger cars. Uh, but in our case, currently the conversion is done by the uh, producer OEM itself. So we only help them to choosing the sensor, uh, central compute and other stuff. So, um, uh, if we, sorry, uh, if you look at the uh, operate uh, specifications, as I said, you know we will be uh, going to the mixed traffic condition at the end of this year with the Romanian uh, deployment. Uh, at the beginning of next year, we will be making the Michigan deployment. And currently we are targeting 35 miles per hour at maximum. So no, it's normal for a, a in-city public transportation. We have some uh, central software which can control the bus, especially for mission management. And also other, uh, different from uh, standard passenger cars, we have a uh, bus stop handling. So we expect the bus stop uh, uh, operation handled autonomously by opening door, closing door, understanding if there is someone in the safety zone of the bus. So we use extra cameras to be able to understand if it's safe to open the doors or close the doors type of thing. So we have some differences in the automated driving stack. 
So uh, if we have a look to the bus, the sensor stack that we are using, we are using five LIDARs, a radar, a high precision GNSS, six cameras, three on the front, three looking back. And we are using uh, two thermal cameras. Uh, I, I think this is uh, also different from some of the uh, cars at the moment. Since the, the bus itself is a bigger platform and it's normally more expensive than a, a passenger car, you have a little bit more space for sensors uh, in the budget. But of course, we expect that uh, those, uh, the hardware costs will go down and we will have more precise sensors maybe in the future less sensors i don't know depending on the quality uh, but this is our current setting the bus can take up to 47 people it has a automated wheelchair control it has a ramp so you can have wheelchairs in it different from those small shuttles and also since we have more space we see while discussing covid 19 uh, with different designs we can still keep uh, social distancing. And uh, the good thing about it is that it's not a retrofitted bus. So we work together with the OEM to design the sensor locations and the cable routings, the placements of the sensors. And uh, we in the uh, CAD environment, simulation environment. So uh, it will be uh, more close to the production compared to the things that you have, uh, you are seeing in the uh, street. If you think about the integration level of the sensors, also since we have a lot of sensors, we are covering the same area with different type of modalities, different type of range. Uh, not for in all, just for increasing the perception quality, but also for fault tolerance. So we expect that even if we lose some of the sensors. If there's a problem with one, uh, some of the sensors, we will still be able to continue our route, maybe with a degraded, uh, degraded service quality, uh, but uh, we expect that we, we will be able to uh, degrade gracefully. So as I explained in the pillars, we have a lot of partners that we are working together with. Uh, as I explained, we are using AutoAir. Uh, we expect that in the uh, deployment time in the serial production, we will have we will get a lot of help from IFX AI. We are using the LGS well simulator. I will show it later on. And uh, these are the current partners that we work with. But we are targeting to increase the partners since uh, public transportation is more like a a system integration project. So you need to be able to integrate with many, many systems. Uh, it's even, it should have an even larger ecosystem compared to uh, passenger cars. So as I explained, we are using a lot of simulation. Uh, so everybody knows why you use simulation, you reduce the cost, you can create edge cases, uh, edge cases much more easily. So normally when you are driving in a highway, uh, you are doing the same thing all the time, maybe like 5% or 10% of the time, you will see something different. Maybe, you know, if you want to test on snow and fog, you need to wait for that. But in the simulation, uh, you can generate most of the edge cases uh, on your desktop. But of course, uh, the before the sim quality of the simulation data is not uh, was not enough. So compared to the camera feed, uh, you cannot generate uh, something very close to the real world. But uh, you know, from when we start, uh, we start using higher quality content. So I will just switch to video and I show a, some quick videos of the contents. So um, so uh, 
as I say, you know, the quality of the video affects the simulation quality too much. So this is the uh, first example we did. This is taken from the facility of OEM. This is the thing that you are seeing is a normal video at the moment. So, you know, we are traveling autonomously inside the test track. And now this is the thing that we create with the professional uh, software normally used for uh, CGI. So you can create anything in the simulation. So we are targeting this quality in the simulation. So we can generate any type of cityscapes, any lighting conditions, different road conditions, different road participants. But of course, the uh, engines that we use at the moment are not in this level. So normally with the gaming engines, uh, the photorealistic software in real time is not easy. This is, if you can see, this is something you can get. Uh, this is an example coming from LG SVL, working together with AutoWare, where you can get the, um, uh, the environment and you can test your software. But the, the quality of the simulation content is not uh, that high compared to the first uh, video. But you can still test most of your uh, scenarios, but possibly in the perception part, the data will be a little bit different from the real thing. Uh, but uh, we focused on the uh, content generation together with our partner. So we generate a little bit a better uh, simulation content by using photorealistic techniques as much as the uh, base uh, gaming engine allows. We expect that as the uh, simulation en engines becomes uh, more uh, focused to the uh, photorealistic content, they can use most of the things in photorealism. I think that we can create much uh, realistic videos uh, with these engines. This is the, uh, the maximum quality that we can reach up to now. It's not bad to com compare to previous gaming type of content, but we are not still there. The, the first thing that we, we are able to generate with uh, professional rendering engines, but not in real time. So this concludes how we do. So I'll pass to Dr. Kerem about uh, the when you have this amount of sensors, uh, like everybody, the fusion becomes an important problem. So Kerem will discuss about that subject. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. In this section, I would like to share some details and um, uh, challenges about the sensor fusion approach that we are currently working on. Um, the sensor fusion is all about perception, and the perception is one of the most important modules in a modular software architecture in an autonomous vehicle. And if um, there is an error in the perception, there is almost no chance to recover it in the rest of the system. So, and we use sensors uh, for perception, for perceiving the environment and the uh, state of our own vehicle. Uh, by the way, we are not seeing the slides, uh, Dr. Ali. Oh, okay. Okay, I need to, sorry. Okay. I so, need to switch to the slide set, sorry. Okay. So we know that the uh, sensors have different uh, characteristics. So in terms of environmental conditions, uh, some of them are affected by illumination. For instance, we cannot use a visual camera at night, but we can use uh, a thermal camera or a LiDAR uh, instead. Uh, and some of the um, sensors are affected by weather conditions. Uh, in terms of uh, the data they provide, uh, there are differences. Some of them uh, provide depth information. Uh, some of them provide color information. Uh, they have different ranges, accuracies, uh, physical dimensions, and costs. 
So they have actually um, complementary properties. Uh, we had already mentioned about uh, our sensor configuration on our bus. Uh, but when we look at the rest of the autonomous uh, driving landscape, most of the other OEMs uh, are either planning uh, or using uh, the multiple sensing modalities in their configurations. We can see examples of uh, either um, multiple sensing modalities or multiple sensors from the same modality. Uh, this is also a challenge, how to combine them. Of course, those modalities can be uh, used separately in the vehicle for uh, separate purposes, for separate uh, functions. But ideally, uh, we can combine them or fuse them uh, to have a better um, perception in order to be able to use or exploit their complementary uh, properties. This is uh, usually referred to as multimodal perception. So we can switch to next slide. Yeah. Um, so we try to combine uh, multimodal signals uh, such as RGB images, LIDAR points, radar points, even map information uh, to have a better understanding of the environment. Uh, by the way, the map information or HD maps is an important source of information, a prior information about the uh, driving environment that can be used in the fusion uh, as well. So the aim is always a better or a more accurate perception and a more robust uh, perception. So accurate in terms of uh, more precise information about the driving environment. Uh, robustness means uh, the perception um, should work properly in adverse weather. Uh, it should work in situations that are not covered during training. And um, it should work properly when some sensors uh, are degraded or even defective. Uh, and of course, like uh, in the any other function in the system, uh, the multimodal perception should be able to run in uh, real time, even if the vehicle is driving at high speeds. So uh, in addition to the conventional methods of uh, sensor fusion, like Bayesian uh, filters, etc., recently uh, the deep learning and the deep learning based uh, approaches have become very popular and many methods uh, have been proposed uh, to employ deep learning uh, for fusion. We can see here some uh, examples uh, for LiDAR only, camera only, and the fusion of LiDAR and camera uh, based detection. And um, we can see that um, deep learning based approaches or methods are among the most successful ones. So what we are talking about actually uh, a deep neural network architecture uh, to solve some perception related uh, problems like object detection or uh, semantic segmentation. We can switch to the next slide, please. Uh, so for object detection, for instance, uh, we are considering such a deep neural network, uh, getting input from the multiple sensing modalities, LIDARs, camera, uh, radar, et cetera, and generating the appropriate outputs, class probabilities, locations, um, etc. So this can also be called as uh, deep multimodal perception. However, uh, there are lots of uh, challenges and open questions while developing uh, such a system, uh, developing uh, a multimodal uh, deep learning based multimodal perception. So this table summarizes them. Uh, we will not go over all of them, but the main topics are the multimodal data preparation. So to be able to train a deep neural network, we need uh, lots of data. So uh, we have to take care of data diversity, data quality, how to label the data, uh, data alignment and synchronization coming from the multiple sensing modalities. Uh, so in terms of fusion methodology, uh, and other aspects of the problem, like evaluation metrics, uh, the network architecture design, and so on. If we uh, take an example and uh, discuss the fusion methodology, for instance, uh, we, can, uh, we have to address three questions. The first one is what to fuse. So what sensing modalities uh, should be fused uh, and how to represent and process uh, those information properly. 
The second uh, question is how to fuse. So what type of fusion operations we should use. And the third one is the when to fuse. So we are talking about a deep neural network architecture and at which stage of that network, at which stage of the feature representation uh, we should combine uh, the modalities, sensing modalities. So uh, when we look at the when to fuse question in more detail, uh, we can have three options. Uh, early fusion, late fusion, and middle fusion. So the early fusion means uh, fusing raw sensor data or pre-processed sensor data. So it is at the very beginning of the pipeline. This is a data level fusion. Uh, late fusion uh, combines the decision outputs, decision outputs of each domain specific network of a sensing modality. So this can also be called as uh, decision level fusion. The middle fusion is somewhere between early and late fusion. Uh, so it combines the future representations from different sensing modalities at intermediate layers of the network. So uh, in the next slide, uh, we see the illustrations of those options. The first one is the early fusion. The second one is the late fusion. Uh, the rest of them are examples of the middle fusion because uh, we can have lots of options for the middle fusion. When we come to the uh, how to fuse question, we should uh, decide on uh, what type of fusion operations uh, we should use, either um, addition, averaging, uh, ensemble, concatenation, mixture of experts, etc. So after answering all those questions and uh, choosing the appropriate options, we come up uh, a fusion architecture. So uh, we can have various fusion architectures. We can see some examples here, just for fusion of two modalities, LiDAR and uh, camera. So as a conclusion, uh, there are no definitive answers for those uh, questions or challenges. So based on your requirements, you uh, have to find your own set of answers. Uh, so based on your use cases, um, your operating conditions, uh, etc. So uh, in summary, it is uh, a challenging task. Okay. Uh, Sanya, should we answer the uh, incoming questions? There are many of them right now, or? Uh... Yes, we are, we have about, uh, let's give ourselves about two to three minutes to answer a few of the questions, both related to sensor fusion and simulation that have, that have come up. Mm -hmm. Now um, I can pick some for you, but uh, if you'd like, please go ahead and, and select the ones that seem most relevant for you to answer. Maybe, you know, I can quickly answer some of them. The one of them is the buses will be aware of each other in the form like something like clusters. Yes, we are targeting that when, the, when you have the uh, vehicle to vehicle communications. We have a lot of experience in vehicular communication, but the physical layer the uh, uh, didn't go through. So uh, we are expecting that we will have better uh, solutions in the communication part. Uh, so there's a question about the operating expenses. So 80% of an uh, transportation operation is coming from either from labor or energy. The 10% is only the bus cost, 10% is maintenance. So if you can reduce the uh, costs in labor and energy, uh, you can have uh, more revenue coming in from that part. So you can sell uh, your bus a little bit more expensive and you can get a bigger uh, portion from the pie when you have an automated bus. And um, so that uh, there are some several uh, questions about the other things that normally bus drivers do. That's a very nice question. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we try to search for when, you're, when we are talking about the other services required for autonomy. So maybe we can go deep inside for that questions. And uh, there's a question about the design. Currently, uh, we are producing a prototype. So we are testing with a real bus. And also we have a, a, a test car. We are trying to solve the sensor placement and configuration problems in the prototyping part. 
So there may be some bottlenecks, some problems. Uh, we are doing a lot of tests on the real bus at the moment. And uh, there are some edge cases question, what, what type of edge quest cases, you know, like for example, you can have an animal jump in front of you. So it's a very rare thing, but it can happen. You can test it with simulation. And uh, uh, yes, the vehicle, there's a question about vehicle dynamics. Yes, they can be simulated to some certain extent uh, in the simulation. But of course, I know that there is uh, extra. We are doing a scientific work to make door, those parameters uh, more dynamic uh, in the implementation of automation together with the uh, university uh, professor. And um, uh, why does the simulator have real-time requirements? It means uh, since you know the uh, normally in the testing area, uh, you don't have you know you can have a slower real time. You're right, but it's not supported by all the uh, engines. Uh, some of the uh, simulation engines support slowing down the real time. But uh, also, if you want to test uh, the driver, train with the driver, you will still need the real time. So, uh, so the most of the simulators are using uh, engines, uh, game engines, and game engines normally have the real time requirement. But for testing, you are right, you can slow it down. And um, in the simulation environment, they're asking about the sensor models. Currently, LIDARs and cameras can be uh, uh, simulated. It's very difficult task to simulate the radar, but the radar sensors are much more closer to the production scale. So mostly we are simulating cameras and LIDARs. Um, There's a question about the sensor health. Yeah, that's a problem. But uh, the, uh, when you are not having a service type of operation in the autonomy, it, it will be like uh, planes at the beginning. There will be some maintenance crew will be checking each sensor uh, at the beginning of the operation and the health of the sensors will be checked. But the uh, sensor hardware problem, it's a more generic problem. I think that it will be solved by the industry. And, uh, I take uh, still... one more sensor question and then we'll move on to the next section. If that's okay, and then come back when uh, at the end of it, if we have time. Okay. I think that uh, there's a question about the safety certification. I think FX AI is is better. So in their uh, lessons, there are good answers to that. Uh, we expect to get a lot of help from people like partners for the safety uh, standards. And uh, the, I think there are some other questions, but uh, maybe we can answer some of them later on. Sounds good. Uh, let's go to the last section here. Uh, before we do that, I have a um, a quick poll, uh, the last set of questions now for the audience. Uh, if you look at your screen, we want to, since many of you are actually software developers, uh, we'd like to understand a little bit about your open source software, especially in your stack. Um, question is about what open source onboard software do you use for autonomy? And there's examples there in the question spanning the stack from um, RTOS middleware framework and algorithms. Right. So take a look at that and uh, I'll close the poll in a few seconds. Um, there's a couple of other topical questions for the next um, section that I'll ask in a minute. Okay, so ending the first question, we have uh, the, the, the winning, if you would call it, open source uh, section of software that's being used really falls into the software framework category. <clears throat> All right, so the next section, we're gonna talk about services and, and the impact of uh, recent COVID-19. Uh, before we jump into that, take a look at the next poll that I've just asked you. 
uh, this this really gets your your input into what services you would feel as a user of public transportation um, would be needed in order for autonomy to to really take off in in uh, public transport. All right, thank you for um, your answers there. Uh, this, this is really uh, quite a mixed set of results for this poll. You can see almost all of the services in one way or the other are important, it sounds like, for you to be able to use, um, to use public, autonomous public transport. And finally, the last question, as I promised um, for you, is to see if uh, COVID-19 really has made, uh, uh, what type of difference it has made for autonomy, specifically in public transportation. <clears throat> Very good, thank you for your answers there. Um, uh, you can see the results on your screen in a moment, but basically uh, it seems like most of us think that autonomy has actually become more important. So back to, back to you, Dr. Pecker, for, for the next section. Yeah, the, uh, we cannot discuss anything nowadays without uh, COVID-19 impact. Also, uh, same for the public transportation. One of the things that we have seen is that even though the uh, even though the most of the people who need to continue to the work still need a safer transportation, so you know there are a lot of people uh, in a pandemic condition. You still need workers for hospital. You need still workers for uh, logistic companies. Not everybody own cars, so especially the people you are need you need it. Uh, the uh, in these type of events, they need to have better public transportation. So most of the uh, bus type of startups are focusing small shuttles because mostly because maybe they're able to uh, produce them and uh, maybe without OEM uh, production facilities, uh, but they're very small. So. Uh, when you need a public transportation, you need the full size to be uh, so you don't fit everybody. So the most of the uh, things uh, happened in uh, public transportation in the time of COVID that everybody was complaining about uh, the uh, buses are fully packed. But uh, when you introduce the uh, autonomy and electrification, you can have more buses without too much increase in the operational costs. You can have platooning cases. Uh, so you can add more buses in the route uh, by, uh, without increasing too much the operational costs. So autonomy makes that possible. So that you can also protect the drivers since the drivers will be still be needed for uh, bringing the bus to the route without passengers, but in the route you can not, uh, you will not use the driver, so you will not lose the driver jobs. But since you will have more buses, should be carried to the route, uh, you can have more buses with same amount of drivers, and uh, you can apply flexible waiting time in the bus stops to avoid people getting into bus in the same time, or. You can apply things like a, uh, like train. You know, instead of having one bus after another bus, you can have three buses at the same time, so that you will uh, get rid of the one empty, one full bus type of problem. So you can normalize the distribution of people inside the buses, and you can have social distance aware interior designs. I will show an example, and also you can have inside interior cameras to warn people 
We are seeing a, a lot of uh, safe disinfection, uh, automated safe disinfection uh, solutions are coming in. So you can apply them automatically and you can apply things like passenger counting to avoid the bus to get uh, much uh, packed. And since you will be getting a lot of data coming in from the intelligent bus, you can design a better global transportation system with the use of this data. And you can have things like virtual bus stops, flexible bus stops to avoid people to uh, work a, uh, walk a lot to the bus stops. So you can change the locations or the timing of the bus stops by use of shared mobility applications. So this is one example that we are working with. Uh, since when you have the full size bus, you can have separations. So it's a simple thing, but it can be done. With this type of buses, you can have separation and you can use different space for everybody. There were a lot of questions about the other services. As I explained before, the uh, bus production itself is something like a system integration. Also, the uh, transportation problem is a system integration. In the past, uh, we were uh, doing a lot of projects together with uh, companies who are digitizing the public transportation, and they were partnering with a lot of companies for electronic tickets, for vehicle tracking systems, for um, also some other uh, you know, modern applications for showing timetables, intelligent bus stops. So you need a lot of services. So with the help of the uh, open platform, with the help of modular design of the uh, platform that we are using at the moment, we can make a more open service. So for example, if there's a company who is handling, for example, uh, interior cameras and making uh, estimates about the risks inside the bus, maybe they are detecting who is smoking inside the bus or uh, there, there, uh, a luggage of uh, one person is take, taken by another person. Also, you know, you need to integrate with payment systems so that instead of, you know, uh, trying to collect this, normally the driver is also a security officer inside the bus. Maybe before removing the driver, they will be uh, sort of, instead of driving, they will be more focused on a CRM type of tasks. So this will also change. Also, the integration with other services is very important. So if you can have something that run smoothly, if you avoid uh, waiting times in the bus stops, and also if you can handle the first mile, last mile very well, you can, if you can provide a door-to-door -door operation, possibly there will be more people interested in public transportation in this new area of the transportation. You know, the, the services that you provide in the transportation problem also affects how the transportation will uh, continue. For example, at the beginning, everybody was sharing a road together with cars, horses, and people were in the same road. So cars become the winner of the transportation. So now the roads belong to the cars and pavements belong to the pedestrians. And uh, uh, the, as far as I know, the AAA started as a bicycle uh, organization, but now it's more related to uh, the uh, motor vehicles. So depending on what type of services, the quality of services also will define the future of transportation. We believe that if we can provide well-integrated, automated, electrificated uh, public transportation, this time uh, I think people tend to use more public transportation. Of course, it will be enriched by other, many, many other services like infotainment, for example. So this uh, concludes this part, also our presentation. Very good. Uh, we we con concluded right on time. Um, thank you, Dr. Becker and Dr. Poor. Uh, that was very informative. Um, and I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot about 
about autonomous public transportation on the technology side and the services and, and your outlook uh, as you see it today. Um, I want to just uh, conclude here. Um, you know, thank you for all the attendees for attending. Uh, that was that was really useful. Thank you for your patience and, and answering all the questions in the polls. Um, I realize we did not answer every single question in the Q&A, but I want to respect everybody's time here and conclude on time. So appreciate that. And uh, yep, thank you. Thank you. thank you very much for joining in. Thank you very much, uh, Sanya and Apex AI for providing such a nice environment for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.